This is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Us Australians will be voting sometime later this year, probably in October, in a referendum whether to enshrine an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voice in our constitution. Our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, has exhausted a lot of his political capital in pushing the voice, yet still won't tell us how it will actually work. Well, we can look across the Tasman to see if the voice becomes part of our constitution, how it might work. Uh, New Zealanders under the Adern Hipkins government are being subjected to Maori co-governance by stealth. My guest tonight, Julian Batchelor, has embarked on a national stop co-governance speaking tour across New Zealand with a general election to be held on October 14th and uh, New Zealand's future is certainly on the line. Julian, welcome to Wilms Front. Thanks, Wilms. I'm, I'm, uh, Tim, I'm just, um, I'm glad to be here because uh, we've got to save, save Australia from what's happening here, I tell you. Yes, and uh, co-governance. So what is it exactly obviously it's causing a lot of uh, discrimination division uh, lot uh, lots of dysfunction in new zealand but what's its actual definition well it's the it's the um elite maori i've called it takeover of new zealand it's it's a a coup by stealth but it's actually not by stealth anymore because it's pretty obvious to anybody who lives here that this is going on and uh, that's what it is. So it's an elite, it's an elite Maori takeover of this country. That's what it is. And so, what what institutions have they they taken over? I I used to do a a, sh a show uh, Trad Tasman talk with Duo De Boer, who's now a board member with the New Conservative Party. He, he always used to talk to me about the 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 three rivers policy. Uh, well, what they're doing is they're getting to absolutely every part of New Zealand. So, first of all, you have to say that this is not even constitutional. They, they are maintaining New Zealand has something called a Treaty of Waitangi uh, that was signed in February the sixth, eighteen forty, and uh, so they say that the co-governance of New Zealand that's New, that's Maori sharing power with uh, the rest of um, you know with with the government is all legal. It's all mandated. That's what they say, but it's not at all. And um, it's based on fraudulent understandings of the Treaty of Waitangi. And so they have already made massive inroads into absolutely every domain of, of New Zealand life. Um, they have, for example, got into schools, re rewritten the constitution, the, the sorry, the curriculum. They've got into the police. They've got into hospitals, they've got into every sort of government department, uh, DOC, that is the Department of Conservation, they've got into councils, they've got into government, the, the activists have infiltrated. Basically, it's like a monster with a hundred heads and a thousand tentacles. And they have got into absolutely everything. And now, I mean, I'm in a, I'm in a city called New Plymouth talking to you. And we tried to, we came into this last night, two nights ago, rolled into the city to do a conference in the race course centre. We were expecting a thousand people. And um, the local iwi, that's Maori, they put pressure on the race course to cancel us. And then we went into, we had to re rebook in a hotel conference room. They cancelled both of that. And what they do is they, they ring up the, the race course or the venue and they say, we're going to burn your premises down. We're going to um, we're going to kill you, death threats, arson threats, and they're severe. They're very, very intense, and so we were cancelled out of the, all the buildings in the town. And we had to revert in the end to a um, to a live stream from a from a private location. So this is like a mafia. This is how much it's got. When you say what have they got, what have they got into? They've got into everything, and there it's it's turning out to be a mafia that's a work in New Zealand, like a mafia. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not so much cancel culture, but threatening culture. The, and you, you've become 
I, I know you you won't be deterred, but uh, you've become a unstoppable unstoppable phenomena. Uh, what has motivated you to, and also what uh, uh, what do you believe has? Uh, I'm not sure if you were expecting to be the the leading activist against co-governance, but just uh, des- des- describe uh, just how much the stop co-governance movement has has taken off, and the fact that there's all these threats to venues and that shows that uh, the, 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 the right people are not, not, not liking uh, that you're get, getting the message out. Well, um, I've, um, I bought a piece of land in 2008. I mean, I was very positive towards Maori in 2008. That's what, and I bought in a, I bought a piece of land that was three and a half acres. It was a really valuable piece of land. Three and a half acres in the most beautiful piece of New Zealand in the Bay of Islands, actually in a place called Rafati. And it was in three lots. And so I, I, you know, and when people say, oh, you're a racist and a white supremacist, that's what I'm accused of now. They're talking in the government of me being a racist and a white supremacist. But anyway, and I, this community was 99% Maori. So how could I be a, a, a white supremacist or a racist if I'm buying? No, no, no white supremacist would buy in the middle of a 99% radical Maori community. Because actually, I, at back then, I had a pretty good view of Maori. I thought they were great. Anyway, so I bought this piece of land. And then within, uh, so I thought I'd, I'd sell one one of the lots. It was in three lots. It's three and a half acres with a beach on both sides. It's absolutely gorgeous piece of property. But I thought I'd sell one little bit so I could get rid of the remaining mortgage. So I phoned a real estate company to come and sell this piece of land. Well, within one hour of the sign being put up, it was chopped down with an axe. The, the sign was chopped down and then suddenly signs appeared all over the land saying this is Maori land not for sale and then videos started appearing online where this is a racist has bought this. He's a white man and uh, and so on. And then uh, I got a call from the police saying you better call off the auction of the land because uh, we've got a an email from Maori and Rafferty saying we're going to come and smash up the auction rooms if the, if the sale goes ahead. And I thought, whoa, what have we done here? And so I purchased the land anyway, so we persevered and we kept going. And on this property was a beautiful two, two-story two Kauri villa that needed restoring. So we got a group of us got stuck into restoring that. So between 2008, 2015, we spent our time restoring this beautiful property, this beautiful um, house, villa, really. It's two-story, amazing property. And so at Christmas time, 2015, by the way, in between 2008, 2015, we had videos going up online maligning me, maligning everybody associated with with my saying that that, that we are um, you know racist, that we're chopping down car- special trees and native New Zealand trees, and that we're doing this and that and everything else. And it was all all about building hate. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to get me off the land and force me off the land, and they wanted to own that land themselves. That's what it was really about. And they did that with a massive hate campaign. And um, anyway, 2015, we rented the house out because we thought, oh, we need to raise a bit of funds to, to you know, to to um, keep things going. So that's what we did. Anyway, three South African families hired the house. It was looking beautiful. We put a million dollars into in restoring it. And uh, two, two o'clock on New Year's Eve, my cell phone went off. I was in Auckland. That's about three hours away from where this place is. And um, I answered it, obviously, and there was a sound of smashing glass, screaming, shouting. You could hardly hear what, what she, the lady was saying. But anyway, what she was saying was, we're having a home invasion. There's 20 Maori men doing a haka, a war dance, on the front lawn. This is 2 a.m. We've got children and women and everybody inside. There's Maori men going around the outside, smashing all the windows of the house. Uh, they threw boulders at the house. It must have been a lot of them there. I mean, just because they threw big boulders and smashed the, the panels on cars, car windows, the weatherboards of the house. They threw big, huge boulders on top of the house, punctured the iron on the roof. They were so big. Anyway, uh, so I said, look, I'll get up there as soon as I can. I did. And when I got up there, honestly, it, um, it was like a, it was not a pretty sight. It was like a war zone. It was like a bomb had gone off in World War Two or something like that, you know. And um, anyway, I went into the community and I said, what the hell did you do that for? 
And they said, oh, your land was stolen from us. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, there's women and children up there and everything. Um, and I said, what sort of people are you to do things like this? No answer. So I went and researched the history of the land because I'm a bit of a journalist. Found out that the land was sold in 1937 to a European school teacher who was uh, working in the community. And back in 1937, the whole community in Rafferty, which is where this place is, by the way, you spell Rafferty, R-A-W-H-I-T-I, -I, turned out at the court in Russell, the Maryland Court, 1937, and they went, wanted to support the sale of this house because they loved school teacher. And so it was exactly the opposite of what they were saying in 2015. They were lying. And they just made it up. And, um, yeah, so I put that book, that book was peer-reviewed by Dr. Paul Moon, who's professor of history at Auckland um, University. And um, I put that book online. They all read it. And I went into the community and I said, you owe me $10,000 because I've proved that you're wrong. And you, you can read the book. Here it is online. It's free. No, no barriers, nothing holding you back from reading it. Well, nothing came of that because, of course, they don't, want, they don't want to take responsibility for their actions. They just want to smash up a house and smash up people and terrorize everybody. And I said, to the, I went into the community and I said, you owe me $10,000 and you need to apologize to the people that you terrorized. Well, there was dead silence. They all went to ground. And then 2000, so we had to forgive that sort of thing. And then 2018. Yeah, that, that, the, the fact that you, uh, that guests were, 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 te were terrorized by a, a, a local mob. I mean, was there any media coverage on this terror no, campaign? Police no, in no, media, no media coverage because the media is in, in New Zealand is in the pocket of the government. That's another whole issue. And uh, the police knew who did it, but they don't want to follow up. Um, and so... You know, through this whole episode, I've discovered corruption in the police, corruption in the media, corruption in the councils, local body councils, just corruption everywhere. New Zealand is a rotting carcass. And I would never have discovered this. Only till you start doing what I'm doing that you get you find this problem. You find out what's really there. And I am uncovering things that you would not believe is going on. And most New Zealanders are just oblivious. And of course, Anyway, so 2013, 2018, I was doing. We were doing some more work in the, on the property. A married woman comes up and she comes up the driveway and she starts throwing stones and rocks at me and everything. And she engages me. She grabs hold of my upper arms, and I knew all this was being filmed on a security camera right behind me. And uh, she said, "I want my land back." And I said, "It's not your land. Go and read my book." Basically, and uh, anyway, she raked her fingernails down the top of my arms, started drawing significant amounts of blood in the end i just chucked her down the driveway took the footage to the police she went to court people in the gallery watched the footage and they said oh my goodness this is this is really bad and the judge just let her off people were the whole gallery just walked out in disgust because it was obviously a wrong decision it was a politically motivated decision and the labor government at that stage was telling the judges to not charge maori so they could bring the maori crime stats down and look good at the election time Wow. So we had to forgive that. And then 2023, we're getting close to 2022, another married lady. We don't see them between these visits. You can wave to them. You can be friendly to them and they just, you're invisible. They don't even see you. And we tried to be, we tried to sort of win them over by giving appliances and timber and all sorts of things, you know, putting them out there for them to take. They never say thank you. They walk through your land. They walk through my land to get to their cemetery. I pay the rates. They get the privilege. Nobody ever says thank you. They just presume it's right. And uh, they have a, a, what we call an entitlement attitude. They're just entitled to do it because they think there's something really special. And um, so to last year, another Maori lady comes up the driveway and says, can I, can I have, come and have a talk with you tomorrow? So we set that up. She came. We had a bit of small talk. Then she said, can I cut to the chase? I said, she said, um, I've come here on behalf of the whole community. We, if you don't give us your land, we're going to burn your house down. So this is the house that we put all this time into. 
by then it was like, you know, 12 years we'd been restoring everything, making it takes ages to restore this big, huge property. And it was pretty much right. So I said, why would I give you my land? She said, well, we just want it. And I said, come on, it doesn't roll like that. We're in 2022. You've got to buy things. If you go to the supermarket, you've got to buy the food. You don't just take it. This is not pre-European days where you just go on a raid, tribal raid, and steal things and take things without paying for anything. And anyway, so the conversation went on, but I was recording it on my phone. It was on the table between the two of us. I took that footage to the police. They said, oh, we can't charge her because she didn't say, I am going to steal your, your land. She's, uh, I'm, she said, oh, it's not, I, it wasn't her who said, I am going to burn your house down. She said, we are. So the police said, we can only charge one person, so we've got to let her off. Anyway, then the next year, what happened? Not, not the next year, sorry. Same year, but later. I got a letter from Heritage New Zealand, which is a government department. So you asked me what elite iwi had gone into. What have they taken over? And they've taken over government. And this letter basically said, Dear Mr. Batchelor, your land has been reclassified as wahi tapu. It's a Maori word meaning sacred land. And you pay the rates, but we have control of your land now. Now, this is we're talking about my, my life savings. So I went, no way you're doing that. It's basically like somebody taking control of your land and you lose the, you actually, I'm still the owner of it, but they legally, but they have control of it. So anything I want to do on that land from now on, I have to, I have to get their permission, Maori permission. So somebody else effectively owns it. Legally, I'd still do. And uh, so I fought that. And one of the minions inside Heritage New Zealand forgot to cut off the correspondence at the bottom of the letter, the email, and there was I saw communication between the government department and local people in the community in Rafferty. And it basically said, hey, bro, which is a Maori term, hey, bro, mother, you know, brother, hey, bro, we got the land. Should we come up and have a feed, a celebration in your local community? And when I read that, I just, I thought, okay, that's it. I've had enough. I'm going to mobilize. They're basically I'm... collaborating with the, the government, the people who have been yeah. terrorizing you and trying to take your land. And let's reverse the, the, the races that, like, so, that like suppose in like uh, this happened in the, the, the U.S. Deep, <laughs> deep South, a black brown family moves into a white area and there's 20, uh, uh, 20 white men with with the flames and uh, wearing hoods and say time time for you to leave that like that happened back in the 60s in the deep south and it is now viewed with absolute disgust how wrong and racist that was and there was a lot of uh, <coughs> age in the, the media at that time, the, the US media, yet fast forward 60 years, uh, reverse the races, and you've just got to, got to cop it. There's, uh, there's this there's this mob of, of people trying to, uh, trying to terrorize you from your land because of your race. That's a very good analogy, Tim. I hadn't thought of it quite like that, but that's, that's what happened. So imagine... Imagine that if they were trying to trying to run a a a white a brown person out of their town because of the color of their skin, and that's what was happening to me. But the media doesn't talk about that at all here, because the media now is in the pocket of the government contractually, and they don't support they they support everything that's about the takeover. So my my message to Australia is, mate, you don't want to let this happen in, to any degree, not a whiff of it, not an inch of it, not a millimetre of it, whatever you want to say. You do not want to let this go forward in Australia. Because I've had tribal rule. I've lived under tribal rule in this little community for 14 years. It's absolutely hell. They try to break you. They try to use intimidation, bullying, heavy psychological strategies like stonewalling um 
uh, bullying, um, uh, breaking things, stealing things, posting videos online, um, treating you like you're a second-class citizen, that you're... Um, it's, it's the ultimate racism. And all of it is about trying to break you so that you become... You submit to them. It's tribalism. And um, it's very severe. It's very wrong. And it's very to be avoided at all costs. And it's going back into something that's dark and deep and terrible, terrifying. And I've had 14 years of it. So I mobilized and said, I'm going to go and tell New Zealand about this because this is what's coming. And most Kiwis have not experienced tribal rule. And I have. And I thought, well, I'm in a unique position to talk about this now because I didn't plan to have this happen to me. It just happened to me. And, um, yeah, that's what's happened. And so I went, no, nah, this is... And then I began to investigate the Treaty of Waitangi to see if if their, their mantra, their narrative about being entitled to all of this, to have 50-50 governance of New Zealand, and really it's not about 50-50. They actually want to take over the whole country, and they've said so in documents in the public domain, and they're angling for that. So then I started investigating the Treaty of Waitangi and the truth of it all, and I discovered a whole lot of other stuff that was completely fraudulent, completely wrong. And so it wasn't just my personal experience that triggered me. I mean, the New Zealand Herald, New Zealand's biggest newspaper, wrote a story, and the story was a double-page story, what triggered Julian Batchelor. Like, whoa, you know, he's a psychopath on the loose. Yeah, I've, I've Googled your name, and it just spits out all of the, the mainstream media, New Zealand Herald stuff, News Hub, all of their, their, uh, their hit pieces on you and uh, all the... the if they don't accuse you of being a racist, they say, oh, yeah, part of his stop go co-governance, like, look, there's there's people around him who are associated with racists. No, I'm, I mean, this, I, I can't, I can't, um, we don't vet everybody who joins in with this movement. Of course, of course you don't. I mean, you have people who join because they sympathise with you, they empathise with you, and that's what's happening in Australia. You're going to have people who are, for the voice, people who are against the voice. And I have the same thing. I don't vet everybody's beliefs when they come and have anything to do with me. I just say, welcome aboard and join in. They know what I stand for. And if they're coming to me, that means they're, 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 they're empathizing with me. And they're saying, hey, um, we, we, we're with you. And so I have had some people who've People who've joined us, a guy like Lee Williams, for example, he was cancelled out of his job, lost his marriage, lost everything because the iwi took to him. So the iwi mafia took to him. And so he had a, you know, he's got a story too. And there's other people who have joined in with this tour um, who have got a story to tell. And you know what I found, Tim? I found there's thousands of people all over New Zealand who've had this happening to them. They've had a brush with what I call the Iwi Mafia. And they're all joining the dots now. And it's all, I wrote a book. It's really, it's, it's really sort of like a booklet. And we've got 350,000 of those out around New Zealand. This is your co-governance book? Yeah. And so what happened is when people started reading that, that's the book there. That's it. You can read it online. Good one. Well done. Tim, you're onto it. You can read it online. And Tim will put a link in here to, to that book. That certainly will. Yeah. Um, that booklet has resonated with New Zealanders. And what happened when they read that is they said, man, and suddenly it becomes clear what's going on. It's like they had a eureka moment. Everybody who reads that book has a eureka moment where they wake up, they're awakened, and they go, oh, my God, I see what's going on here. And I get it now. Because the government's working flat out to hide all this. And you'll have the Albanese government doing the same thing, doing damage control to try and minimise what's coming, try and hide it, try and not let well, you that, know. That's, that, that, that's what he is doing, saying it's a, it's a modest change, modest requests. And the, the polls have uh, 
really turned against the voice now. The yes vote is now in the 40s. It needs a double majority in well, the national vote and four of the, the six states. So him and his uh, indig Indigenous Australians Minister, Linda Burney, they're trying to play down that it's, uh, it's going to be a massive change to Australia. Well, I don't believe a word of it because what they do is they, you know, it, they, they come in with the, um, it's, everything's going to be wonderful, everything's going to be cool, and don't you worry about it. There's nothing to worry about. We have a guy here called Willie Jackson who's a, who's a minister inside the government, and he's telling everybody, don't worry about co-governance. There's nothing to worry about, but it's the worst thing. It's like you're about to get cancer and, you know, don't worry about it. Um, sort of thing. And also they do it by stealth. It's all done little by little. They say, we're just going to do this and we're just going to do this little thing here, but it ends. it's just the thin end of the wedge always. And then as soon as they, it starts, the next thing is the wedge gets, gets, gets rammed in and goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and then, you know, things are not, they start small and they end up massive. That's what's going on in multiple areas all over the country. And that's how you take over a country, little by little. You know, you you eat the elephant. And they're doing that. Well, and for so years in Australia, uh, there have been uh, special uh, rights and uh, positions and benefits uh, for those who identify as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. That's a, that's a whole other uh, question about uh, the, the criteria uh, to... Uh, be able to identify and be accepted as an Aboriginal. Uh, the uh, one of the 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 leaders of the the, the No campaign, Gary Johns, uh, uh, he he was uh, uh, smeared because he said he suggested there should be a, a a blood test to determine Aboriginality. I'm not sure if you have I uh, have in New Zealand. Uh, uh, many uh, people claiming uh, Maori, who it's murky whether they are or not. No, what we have in New Zealand is in 1974, there was a law change, and um, it was something like the Maori Identity Law or whatever it was called. But it happened in 1974, and they changed it. You used to have to be 50% Maori blood or more, 50% or more Maori blood. And to be called a Maori, and then they changed it to you can self-identify. That's what it, that's what the term is. So you, all you got to do now is just say you're a Maori. You don't even have to be a Maori at all. You have to have you can have zero Maori blood in you, and you're a Maori. And what the implications that are, are, are frightening. And it was all part of it was all part of um, the bid to take over. There's been a determined group of small minority group of people. By the way, I'm not talking about all Maori. I'm talking about elite Maori. There's people driving this at the very top of Maoridom. They're tribal leaders. They're corporate tribal representatives and so on. And this is the this is a fact. For every 33,000 people on the Maori roll, because we have a ridiculous um, system here for we have a Maori roll. In other words, sort of all the Maori's roll, you put, on, put on a roll to vote, and everybody else is non-Maori. Well, for every 33,000 Maori on the Maori roll, they get an, a Maori electorate. In other words, pretty much a Maori, they get a Maori MP. And for everybody else, it's 47,000. So if they get a million people on the Maori roll, they can have pretty much half of parliament, you know, or a huge block in parliament. How many Been, seats do they have? There's 120 in your parliament. 100, 120 seats. Well, they could get a huge block, like, you know. How many do they have at the moment? They have 25%. They're overrepresented already. So 25% of MPs are Maori, and they're only 14% of the population. So they're already over overrepresented. And But we've got Maori MPs now going around the country saying, everybody get on the Maori roll because now it's a beautiful opportunity. And we've got a lot of woke white people getting on the Maori roll. Just because you can just say you're what you're Maori and you are, just choose to go on this role, and then as I said, they get a they get these certain number of MPs for certain number of people on the role. So if they were smart and they have woken up to this, they could get a massive swag of new Maori MPs and then take over the country legally. 
Um, and so the Electoral Commission, when we started MMP here, recommended that we actually abolish the Maori seats because they've had them for a long time. And there's no, uh, just to uh, be, uh, be clear, New Zealand has no written constitution. There is no uh, requirement to have these Maori seats in the parliament. No there's, no, there's no written constitution in New Zealand, no requirement to have them, just that the gutless MPs won't, won't abolish them like they should, and they're trying to curry favour with Maori. They're only a small percentage of the population. It's ridiculous. We've got the tail wagging the dog here. And in Australia, it's even smaller. How much? What's the percentage of Aboriginals in Australia? It's around about three uh, percent, but uh, they're already uh, well more than represented in the the federal parliament. It's uh, it's around about four percent of federal politicians uh, identify as Indigenous uh, from all of the, the major parties. So the Liberal Party, National Party, Labor Party, Green Party. And so there's already a voice in the parliament. Well, there you go. There's right there is apartheid racism. So they're wanting more than, than just being proportionally represented in the country. And it's supposed to be equality. We're supposed to be living in a, in a, in a liberal democracy where there is equality. We have 160 cultures in New Zealand. You, you'd have the same at least the same and they're yes. all supposed they're all supposed to be treated equally so what's special about the aboriginals why are they being treated specially why are the maori being spe treated specially this is apartheid this is apartheid this is racism this is wrong i'm going no it is uh, because it's giving one group of people based on their their race or part of their their blood, uh, e ethnicity, extra rights. And obviously the arguments that are put forward in Australia about uh, why uh, we need to yield to, uh, it's based on the, uh, the, the Aboriginal voice, voice it was originally voice to parliament, but it's going to be a voice to parliament and the executive, which can include the Reserve Bank and the Defence Force. So it's, it's already, uh, it, 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 it's, it's already, expanded before we've even had the the chance to vote on whether we want it or not uh, so the 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 argument is that uh, uh, because there was no treaty uh, with uh, British settlers well there was over 300 uh, indigenous tribes living all over the vast continent uh, mm -hmm. so there'd have to be 300 different treaties uh, so their argument is that our oh, sovereignty, was never ceded, even though in my city of, of Melbourne, <laughs> sovereignty was ceded uh, when the founder, John Batman, signed a, a, a treaty with the local Indigenous uh, uh, people. But uh, I, I digress here. But that's the argument, that uh, because they are the first Australians and they've been here for 60,000 years and they have, th therefore, the the Indigenous Australians here currently, by uh, their blood and ancestry, uh, have a greater connection to the land through their blood, and therefore should have an extra voice. That's that's the argument. No, well, that's wrong. It's not wrong saying that they were the first people here. Our Aboriginals can say that. Maori can't say that here in New Zealand. They're not Indigenous Maori. There was other people here before them, and we're all just settlers. And um, Indigenous people are people who've been there from the very beginning. Now, Aboriginals might claim that. But you know what? They're all benefiting from a democracy, the Aboriginals. And they're getting education, health, medicine, roads, everything that is modern, that is good, that is right that they would say is beautiful and wonderful and yet they don't want to be treated equally they want some sort of special privilege why well again i'll i'll make the point that you make this is the the aboriginal elite the activist class and uh, a lot of them have uh have been exposed to be communists, uh, such as uh, uh, Thomas May Mayo and 
uh, Tila Reid. Uh, but uh, the the main uh, voices of the the no campaign is uh, country liberal senator Jacinta Price and uh, Warren Warren Mundine, uh, both Indigenous Australians, and they make the point that this will be a vehicle for the elites to divide us and won't actually solve uh, the. the because most of the disadvantage is in remote communities, which if you're in a remote area, obviously you're not going to have the same opportunities as anyone living in a city, Aboriginal law of any any other race. And another point I want to get onto is a lot of this grievance is, is learnt. I, that over the past 50 years, a lot of... Aboriginal Australians and Maori New Zealanders would have been taught that oh, the reason why your life is, uh, some of your lives are not that great is because of uh, white oppression and discrimination. And so a lot of this hatred has been recently taught. Well, our hatred goes back to our, our grievance industry goes back to 1840. And this is what would happen. I was actually split this, had this explained to me by a historian See, it started in 1840 when the treaty was signed, and what hap what would happen is a Maori would go to a European and say, do you want to buy this piece of land? The European would say yes, the European settler. He'd sell the land for, say, £10. But because the land was owned by a communal, communally, um, the government would give this person £10, and then other people who had ownership rights over that land would come to the government and say, wait a minute, we want £10 too. And there was 10 people, so the government had to fork out £10 to all of them because they all came to the government complaining in 1840 that they all deserve £10 as well because they've got a share in the land. But they made a huge mistake by doing that, the government did. They should have said, no, we've paid out the £10. Now you share out the original £10 with those 10 other people. In other words, a pound each. But the government did a ridiculous thing. They paid £10 to everybody. This is just an example. And... Um, so they got the idea, man, if you complain, you get money. If you kick up a big fuss and you kick up a big stink, the government just pays you money. And so we've trained them. We've created an absolute monster. And there will be people in Australia, the elite Aboriginals, if you want to call them that, who are opportunists. They've worked out how they can get large amounts of money, large assets, that belong to all New Zealanders and all Australians and how they can get them for free just by complaining and um, by demanding. And you must not give in to that because you'll create a monster. And the monster's on the loose here and it's pretty hard to get back in the, in the cage. Oh. I would agree with that. And it's called reconciliation in Australia, except it's never defined when a Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal Australia is going to be reconciled. It just it, It's supposed to just go on forever, and which is the thing when it comes to whether it be diversity, uh, equality. There, there doesn't seem to be an end point. And, there, and you're up absolutely right the more that you yield or cave in then you may get more radical and extreme i just I, uh, I just said to you before it was that uh, this voice proposal well it was supposed to be just recognizing indigenous australians as the first australians in our constitutional preamble then these aboriginal elders or leaders got together and formed this Uluru Statement of the Heart, which it wasn't just about a voice, it was about uh, truth-telling and a treaty as well. And now this statement is is gospel. But you see that from just a, a preamble how far, far uh, how far, how more extreme the proposal has got to. Now, if we, we're told it's just going to be an advisory body, but we don't trust our our high court. They've invented Aboriginal uh, a, 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 Aboriginal rights through high court decisions such as Marbo, Wick, and the Love decision. Yeah, well, of course they um, 
you know, if you counted up how much money was given to Aboriginals over the, over the years and, and how much good it's done, it's done zero good. And, and that's more than paid the rent. That's another slogan. We've got to pay the rent to the uh, traditional owners. Yeah, well, you, it doesn't work. The only thing that works is assimilation, not separation. It's the same in New Zealand. Maori want to go back into their old ways, their old Maori culture, and they become a massive... They're unhappy themselves. They become a massive burden. I mean, you if you counted up how much money you've given to Aboriginals and, and what's happened to it, it makes absolutely zero difference. It's wasted, and it's like a bottomless, it's like a bucket with a massive holes, and it just pours through and goes out into nowhere, into the ether. And it's happening in New Zealand. It's going to happen in Australia. The only thing that's going to bring the solution here is when... There are great Maori in New Zealand. This is the thing. And what they've done, the greatest Maori are the ones who've assimilated, like Saraparananata, who was New Zealand's greatest MP, greatest Maori. He was an MP in the 1920s and 30s. He did not um, separate off from, the, from society and say, we want to go back to our roots. He joined in and he was assimilated and he became, the, often stood in to be the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand. And he... He was a, a fantastic Maori and a, and a massively important, significant Maori figure. And he proved that the way forward for Maori was to assimilate, not separate. And you've got Aboriginals who just want a lot of money and they are not going to assimilate. They're not going to westernize. They're going to end up being a monster with a thousand tentacles and a hundred heads. And they will be insatiable. You'll never satisfy them. That's, it's happened in New Zealand. Waititi, who's the, one of the leaders of the Maori Party, said they don't want full and final settlements. Full and final settlements for land grievances were supposed to be met in 1960. And then it all opened up again in 1975 with the Treaty of Waitangi Act. And away we go. And we're having another round of it here. And now they say they don't want full and final settlements. They want 20 billion dollars a year 20 billion that's a 20,000 million a year passive income for what for just to feed their passive in income and to give them passive income and you know it's insatiable and if you do this you're training the monster and it gets bigger and stronger and Australia is about to let the monster out of the cage if you do that you're gonna, there's gonna be tears flowing in the gutters of your streets in 20 years, 30 years time. Well, the fact that you have a, a race based party, the, the Maori party, that's also uh, extremely problematic. And now, the, the, the non uh, racial parties, the Labour, National, uh, Green uh, Act, and we'll throw in New Zealand first, what are their policies on co-governance if they if they're defined because yeah you have an election in well it's uh, two be two and a half months so not long and you have not three long. year terms three year terms so all of the parties um if you look at it like a horse race the finishing line being the election which is october the 14th all of them are coming up the home straight and all of the pro all, all of the parties the only party that's going to say they're going to expunge co-governance, in other words, repeal all race-based legislation, would be in New Zealand first, it's called. And then closely behind them, there's, there's a lot of minor parties who'd say they're going to get rid of co-governance, but they're too insignificant to be influential. Um, but of the parties that have any show of getting some cross the line, you know, first, second, third kind of thing, um, national is a real big worry. It is they... It is the biggest party, opposition party in parliament, and yet the leader is woke, a guy called Chris Luxon. Yes. He's, he's very woke. He's learning Maori. He's gathering in Maori MPs everywhere, and he's going to keep co-governance go going. I didn't that. Could you try again? Oh, I'm sorry. That's my he's woke, and he's, he's, um, he's going to keep co-governance going to a limited degree. He said he's not going to have co-governance with social services like hospitals, um, schools, and so on. But he's all for it with natural resources like rivers, mountains, 
So he's not. So he's not going to go as far as Labor have done in healthcare. The fact that you have a separate Maori health system now, and including uh, there's special treatments on on waiting lists. That's is that too far for him? But he's okay with all the other 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 uh, co governance arrangements. Yeah, that's too far for him. But he wants to be, in my opinion, he wants to be the prime minister more than he wants to help New Zealand. Yes, he wants, I would say no. he wants it on a CV. It's just a badge. And so he's not even... i tell you what happened, Tim. There's, a, there's some MPs, there's an MP in, sorry, in Kaikoura, a national MP in Kaikoura who was doing his, you know, um, whipping up support for his, for his... And he was running these meetings all around his electorate. And they had a board inside their tent and it had a big piece of core flute, you know, and on the top of it said, what is your major concern for New Zealand? And then the choices down the left-hand side were health, crime, ram raids, education, inequity, housing, blah, blah, blah. A list of them. Co-governance was not even on the list. That tells you how out of touch they are. So I've got somebody who's the secretary of that particular National Party electorate. So she wrote on the bottom of the board, there was a bit of a space, she wrote co-governance. Now what they were asking people to do who came and visited that tent and talked to the MP was put a little blue dot next to the issue which you felt was the most pressing for New Zealanders. And um, so, you know, when... Um, when we put co-governance on there, we came back two hours later and co-governance was off the charts with blue dots. Not enough room on the board and everybody else had five, six, 10, 12. The maximum was like 50 and co-governance reached that in two hours. People coming along, putting dots on, saying it is the issue of the moment. And National was so out of touch with reality, it did not even have that as a choice on the board. And that was put out by the National comms team given to all MPs to when you go around your electorates and you're drumming up support, see what everybody says in your electorate as to what is the main issue and get them to put little blue dots on the main issue so we can, and then feed that back to us so we know what everybody's thinking and we can chisel our campaign to to meet that need, you know, to scratch where everybody itches. And co-governance was not even on the board. That tells you how far out of touch with reality is Mr. Luxon and his party. But he's going to get in, unfortunately, by default, because he's going to get in because people hate Labour and they're not going to vote for Labour. And it, he's going to get in by default, not because he's a great leader, but by default. Well, in Australia, our uh, federal opposition leader uh, Peter Dutton has a bit more of a, a, a of a spine. Uh, he, uh, the Liberal and National parties, the the the, co the coalition uh, centre right, came out against uh, the 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 voice. Though they said they are for the preamble and the constitution. So if if the voice uh, gets voted down uh, and Peter Dutton, if he becomes Prime Minister, could have another referendum for us and therefore legislated regional and uh, and local uh, voices. Uh, but, uh, so s sort of uh, having a, like putting putting out a a proposal to say, look, look we're, we're, we're for some sort of voice, just not uh, this voice. Uh, but Peter Dutton, he hasn't been afraid to say that uh, the constitutionally enshrined voice will re-racialise Australia. Uh, so we actually do have a uh, 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 do have on the, on the right uh, politicians with some spine, and it seems to be the that's why in New Zealand it's been able to be by stealth uh, uh, because uh, the 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 centre right parties us in New Zealand are just so timid and what you just said the National Party wanted to bury a co-governance being an issue do any National Party members uh, attend your events no none what if they are they allowed to like is there some sort of Absolutely. no 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 they can come anytime they want to oh in no fact... I mean like 
if if it was discovered that one of their members had attended that's what I'm getting at attended uh, one of your stop co-governance meetings well they never have so I don't know what the reaction would be but none of them have and I think that officially national wants to play down co-governance and try and forget about it but I have people who are writing to me from meetings where Mr Luxon's going and they're reporting things like 70% of the questions given in the Q&A time are about co-governance. And Mr. Luxon looks very uncomfortable and very out of his depth and like, please get off this subject quickly. Kind of body. <laughs> that, that's excellent to hear. Yeah, get off this subject quickly. I do not want to talk about this. And, you know, he needs to get a grip, man, because... There's 160 cultures here. He is, if he's going to be the next prime minister, he's got to keep that fixed in his sights that everybody's got to be treated equally. And if he wants a, a democracy and if he wants equality and he wants to get rid of racism and apartheid, then that's what he's got to do. But he's not in touch with that at the moment. He's woke. He thinks it's quite trendy to actually keep all this going. And it's hard to believe, but it's true. And he is going to get in by default, unfortunately. But he could have a, a Damascus Road experience. He get get knocked off his donkey with a lightning bolt. And hopefully that's going to happen shortly because we're getting the books out more and more and more and more and more people are asking questions when they go to a Luxton, Luxton um, event. And he's just going to get hammered the next two months. And so he has got to have his Damascus Road experience and expunge co-governance from all legislation in New Zealand. If he did that, Tim, he would win by a landslide. And he would be a real leader if he did that. And even though I've praised Peter Dutton for uh, opposing a, the, the constitutionally enshrined voice, uh, if he becomes prime minister, he's not going to get rid of all of these existing Aboriginal bodies, such as the uh, National Indigenous Australians, agencies there's already we already have it's uh, one of one of our contributors calls it the aboriginal industry s superstructure uh there, there's still a lot that i uh, the the coalition won't touch well i don't know how entrenched it is in australia already but you want to stop it before it gets out of hand and um, if you keep going, it will get out of hand and it will take over. If the, the well, I'm pretty certain now the, the, the Australians will vote no to the voice. We'll probably get another news poll in the next 10 minutes or so. They're published every, every, every fortnight. Uh, but if Australia votes, votes no, it'll be one of the strongest rebukes uh, that we don't want to open open this this well it's it's not even a can of worms but uh, op open up this monstrosity because once it's in our constitution it's pretty much going to be there for the rest of Australia's existence because well, we've had forty four referendums only eight have have succeeded uh, so uh, the bar is pretty high and. We had a, a last public vote we had was 2017 for same-sex marriage, which was voted in favour 61 to 39. So it, it was pretty conclusive after that, that Australia was going to legalise same-sex marriage, but that's a separate issue. But a on this, a decisive no vote, I think, would really... Uh, really rebuke uh, the, the, the current way uh, that the that uh, indigenous affairs aboriginal affairs is 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 in australia there'll be there'll be a many, if if a party wants it uh, to say we're going to get rid of all of these uh, special Indigenous Australians agency. Uh, that That's what made Pauline Hanson, uh, leader of One Nation, so popular when she made her maiden speech back in 1996. Mm -hmm. Well, 
um, we need to bring her back, don't we? I mean, she I is think back. She is back. Uh, she's she's in the Senate now, and she is she is against the Voice, but uh, she, uh, she, uh, she, uh, she has only been able to bring one nation uh, so far. Okay, well, maybe she needs to, um, uh, you know, adjust her policies, adjust what she's doing. I don't know all the ins and outs of, of what she's done. But what she's got to do is she's got to bat for, like, I think Aboriginals should have a representative voice in Parliament because they're one of the the, the 160 cultures that you have. Well, in they that do. I, I mentioned before they do. Yeah, you talk about that. And that's all, that's, that's wonderful. But for them to say we want an un, a, an imbalanced we want we want to be overrepresented we want to have special treatment we want to have special handouts and special structures and special this and everything else then that's apartheid you cannot have that in a democracy you've got to stop that you've got to make sure all people groups are treated equally and like i said we still don't know anthony albanese says uh uh, once uh, you vote in favour of the voice, because par it's up to Parliament to decide how the voice will actually uh, be structured, how many members it will have, how they'll be elected. That's going to be another <laughs> another whole ordeal, and then whether it's actually whether there's actually going to be any, <laughs> it's going to be full of like actual. Aboriginals, not a lot of the the fake Aboriginals that seem to be be coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's 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 not going to be over by uh, a long shot. But with uh, your stop go co governance uh, campaign, uh, so once the the speaking tour uh, wraps up, you're planning a a rally uh, during the election, which I have to say is uh, extremely daring given that there'll probably be a huge counter uh protest and uh, new zealand is now famous for how they ran uh kelly j Keane uh from auckland and new zealand earlier in the year uh, uh tell us uh, about the the rally that you're planning well we're actually going to have um street marches in every city um and every town not every town because some of the towns are going to join up together and do it like all this, all the little satellite towns around Christchurch or little satellite towns around Auckland and so on. Um, so we're going to have marches in many cities, put it that way, around New Zealand on the 17th of September. And if that brings out the activists, well, so be it. Let's put it all out there. Let's Let's get it out on the table and talk about this issue. Let's debate it maturely, intelligently, and let's have this debate about co-governance. And, um, you know, bring it on. Let them all come out. I don't care. It's great. It's going to create a great media frenzy. It's like putting burley out the back of a boat when you're fishing. And so, so let, them, let them come. And I think that's why you've resonated uh, uh, so much is that uh, your uh, determination and, and also the fact that you 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 get it you you have to ha have to put your foot down and say this any form of uh, co governance or separatism is unacceptable in a, a liberal uh, democracy. So. You, you've become quite. You, you've become very much a a, a fearless crusader, which uh, I know that you're a, a Christian as well. Uh, so you've become a phenomenon. So thank you for for speaking uh, with uh, with me tonight and my Australian audience. And uh, we'll certainly keep following uh, the uh, the the stop co governance campaign. Uh, you've still got uh, a few dates a few dates coming up oh we have more dates popping up on there all the time so uh, there's no shortage of dates it's just a matter of trying to slot them all in so what you've just shown on there is about to be updated in fact i was talking with the lady who coordinates all the all the um her name is vicky she's wonderful and uh, so we're going to update that with a whole fresh set of um dates and events coming up around new zealand a lot of them now we're going to do tim are going to be 
virtu- are going to be virtual. They're going to be um, live streamed from locations around the country because we're getting a massive, like tonight we just did one today, and um, I don't know, within an hour it had 2,000 hits, 2,000 views, and, well, that's a big conference. If you had one of those, if you had 2,000 people turn up at a conference, that's a decent-sized conference. and We can get that online, so we're going to keep those going. And you've got a, a YouTube a channel uh, as well, which is uh, called uh, Stop Co-Governance. Yep. And uh, I appreciate you uh, coming on so late in at, at New Zealand time. It's uh, after 11.30. That's, that's okay. There. I'll get you back another time. <laughs> And uh, here at The Unshackled, we're going to be uh, covering uh, the New Zealand uh, gen- general election. Uh, we, uh, we're, sti- we're still our old uh, Trad Tasman Talk team. We still collaborate, so we'll probably have a election special. Who knows? The, the voice referendum and the, uh, the New Zealand general election could be on the same day. Well, wouldn't that be exciting? And so I'll be watching you guys with interest, and let's see if we can get some action happening in Australia. Are you going to have any marches? Are you going to have anything? Is there any c- civil marches going on, anything, protests against The Voice? Is there anybody got the guts to go and do that in Australia or are you all just sitting around? There are a lot of no events that, like, like you're doing, stop stop uh, co-governance events. Uh, so mm-hmm. th- that is is very promising. The, the Yes uh, campaign lobby, which has got, I think, Ten ten million dollar war chest at least. Uh, they've had, well, so called uh, community uh, yes, yes uh, rallies. Uh, so c- certainly uh, there is a lot of activity uh, going on, and uh, th- thankfully, uh, overwhelmingly the the no uh, events haven't been uh, infiltrated or disrupted uh, like like yours have been. Yeah, well, we're more advanced over here. The, the, whole, the whole takeover is far more advanced in New Zealand than it is in Australia. But you need to, Australians need to be looking here to say, you know, with their binoculars, saying this is what's coming for Australia. We're having, you know, we had an event the other day where, Mary Lady lurched at my laptop in the middle of a conference and smashed it on the ground. We're having death threats, burning down your house threats. We're going to come to your home threats. This is and this is this is this is coming, mate. You you we we Australians need to look get the binoculars out, look across the ditch, and say, mate, there's a projection for the future for Australia if we keep this going. Well, that's why I had you on tonight as a as a word of warning, and uh, I hope that when Australia does vote no, it does also re- reverberate in New Zealand as well, uh, because we are uh, we are uh, Anglo Spear cousins or uh, siblings, whatever you, whatever you want to, to to call it. We play the same sports, cricket, rugby union. And New Zealand smashed us in the Bledisloe Cup uh, I see last that. night. So, um, <laughs> it's not always been like that. Sometimes you hammer us. We sort of take it in turns, don't we? So you have to get over it when you lose a big one. Uh, rugby union's been on the decline in Australia of, of, of recent years. New Zealand, I'm not surprised there. They still remain the, uh, the kings. Uh, but mm-hmm. it, it, oh, no. if only... If only that's the only rival rivalry we had to worry about. Not <laughs> who's got who, who's got the the worst uh, separatism going on in their country. <laughs> True. Good point. Thanks, Tim, for everything. Good one. Take care, and yeah, we'll certainly keep in touch. Okay, great. Thanks. See ya. Bye. This is Will's Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net.